So the coming 15 minutes, I would like to give you a brief introduction of the food related context of the metropolitan area of Amsterdam. My name is Arjen Spijkerman. Uh, I work for Wageningen Environmental Research. And I think it's very important to understand what kind of role your greenhouse concept should have in the context of this larger uh, food network, food picture of this metropolitan area of Amsterdam. If we look at the map, the highlighted area on the map is the metropolitan area of Amsterdam. We have in the central location, we have the city of Amsterdam and two other large cities, which is Haarlem in the west and the new town city, which is Almere. We have three important economical or logistic motors in the metropolitan area of Amsterdam, which is, uh, which is the harbor area of Amsterdam, uh, the airport uh, uh, called Schiphol, and we have the largest horticulture auction, uh, which is the Floriade, uh, which is uh, Flora Holland. Um, uh, because I think in, in the logistic sense, it's, that's basically also the motor, the economical motor of this metropolitan area metropolitan area of Amsterdam. If we look, uh, if we look in, the, in the more landscape scale, the city of Amsterdam is a delta city. In the west we have the, uh, the dune area which is protecting this hinterland from the North Sea. And in the hinterland you have basically, you have a peat area. In this peat area that's basically the, um, uh, the dairy sector, that's where the cows uh, and the milk production uh, uh, and the yogurt and the cheese, etc. And we have in the, uh, in the west, we have uh, a new polder, because on the west area, the whole, the west lake, that's more the, uh, that was a formal estuary, which we dammed in the 1930. And in 1960, we developed this whole new polder, which is called the flavor polder. And each landscape has got different type of soils, different type of topsoils, and therefore al also another type of uh, agriculture production. In this section, we can, uh, we can, we can see that um, in the west, we have, uh, on the left side, we have the North Sea, and then the dune area, which is protecting the hinterland. The dark green area, that's the peat area. And this, in this peat area, that's where you have the meadow landscape, where you have the dairy sector. And this water was always, it is on one way, it's quite challenging, eh, because we are very vulnerable for, uh, uh, for, for water. Uh, on the other hand, it also gave us uh, economic growth and prosperity because we were able in the history, Amsterdam was able to trade in a very easy way uh, the food related products from the farms in the hinterland towards by waterways to, uh, to the markets in the city. These days, these waterways are not used that much anymore. So I think it also, could also be challenging in a logistic sense to make use of these uh, waterways again. Well, here, here on this picture, we see uh, where the, the different type of food producing landscapes are located. We have along the dune area, we have more the horticulture industry. And therefore, this Flora Holland auction is very important. We have on the south, we have the uh, more the greenhouse area. Uh, we have in the uh, more the, the total west of the Netherlands, we have more the, the meadow, uh, the dairy landscape and the crop production on this, um, uh, on this flavor polder. On this slide, we see the total food system with all its food system elements. In the previous slide, I just gave a short introduction of, about the food production landscape in the metropolitan area of Amsterdam. The next part is the food processing industry. It's a, it's a very big industry, especially in the north of Amsterdam, where all the crops are being sent to. Uh, being brought to and from there it's being distributed to the distribution centers from the big supermarket or it goes all the way or it's being brought by truck all the way to the harbor of, uh, of Rotterdam from where it's being sent to the rest of the world. Imagine also that um, uh, uh, the Netherlands is the second largest food exporter in the world, so after the United States. Well, the next uh, food system element is the logistic part. Uh, the distribution and the aggregation. Amsterdam uh, at the moment has got about 2.5 million inhabitants and it's going to grow the coming decades with 200,000 new houses. And infrastructure uh, is, is very, uh, very important and uh, because about 40% of all the, the big trucks is food related. So you can imagine that if we come up with new interesting concepts 
and we can reduce this number of tracks, yeah, that's already a win-win situation. So that has got quite some uh, a high priority. We see also some very clear trends at the consumers in the city of Amsterdam. Uh, people are more, uh, are more willing to pay for more sustainable, high quality food, but also local food. So what you, what you see uh, uh, currently that the, uh, the food producers, are, uh, the farms are more producing for the international market, but now there's a trend of getting more uh, short ch chains between the food producer and the consumer in the city. And another trend is that people are buying their food more online. You have new concepts like Picnic and Bol.com, which is just, just bought over by, uh, uh, by the biggest, uh, one of the biggest supermarkets uh, in the Netherlands. If you look at uh, uh, the policy, the food policy of Amsterdam, um, uh, there are three components which are food related where, where the city is really focusing on. So it's not that they have interest in a food system as a whole, but more uh, the food health is a very important issue for the city of Amsterdam. Obesity, uh, obesity, uh, obesity is a very important uh, uh, team, uh, especially in the west of, uh, of Amsterdam. So food, quality of food is very important. Another thing is uh, uh, the valorization of food waste. About 30% of all the, the, the food waste uh, uh, is about, uh, is, is, is of, of the household waste is food related. And at the moment, most of this household waste is going to the incinerator. So it's being burnt. So we want to prevent that. Uh, so now there are some programs to, yeah, to get more valorization, to do interesting, uh, to get energy or to get new products out of this food waste. Amsterdam also hosts quite some food related events. I will show that in the next slide. And in this picture we see a circular model. That's our ideal picture. What we want to do is to use this food waste also for a resource, resource and waste recovery. So, for, so we can use it for uh, power to protein concepts or to use it as a compost for the, uh, the food producers in the uh, surrounding. As I just mentioned, Amsterdam hosts quite some food related events. We have quite some NGOs who are organizing events, uh, uh, but also uh, entrepreneurs are really focusing on to improve the, 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 the rural linkages between the city and the rural landscape. We also have some high profile um, um, uh, uh, food related NGOs. This is, uh, this is a very interesting map provided by the city of Amsterdam. Here you see all the different food initiatives taking place in the city of Amsterdam. It's about uh, more the urban agricultural, uh, more communal, uh, communal uh, uh, initiatives till yeah, really innovative uh, ways of, uh, of uh, food production. Another big, uh, big thing is happening is the Floriade. The Floriade is the biggest horticulture event in the world. It's taking place every 10 years and in 20, 2022 it will take place in the city of Almere, which is the new town of, uh, uh, of, the, city, uh, of the metropolitan area of Amsterdam. Um, the food is, uh, this, this event will showcase all different new concepts of green cities, but also what the role of a city can have on uh, on food resiliency and about the food shed of such a metropolitan area. Well, the next slide, Food Center Amsterdam. It's a very interesting concept that, um, well, to begin with, uh, uh, Amsterdam has got a very rich uh, uh, restaurant culinaire industry. Uh, we have about 4,000 restaurants and this number is still increasing. The food center of Amsterdam is quite it's, it's, it's like a food, uh, a food market for the, uh, for the, for the restaurant uh, sector. It has, got, it has got quite a central location in the, Amsterdam, uh, in the city of Amsterdam, as we see on this uh, uh, map. And um, yeah, all the, uh, the, the, the food producers are bringing their, uh, their goods to this food center of Amsterdam and from there it functions like an open market and from there the restaurants are buying their, uh, their goods. Uh, urban Consolidation Center. 
And why I introduced this slide? Because as I mentioned earlier, the logistic is very important. We want to reduce the number of trucks entering the city. The, the, uh, the Belmer Bias also has a quite central location at a whole bundle of different infrastructure. You have waterways, you have the rail road, you have the net, uh, uh, the metro lines, and you have, the, you have the, uh, the highway close by. So I can imagine that uh, such concepts like uh, food hubs or urban consolidation center could also trigger and stimulate also yeah, more the logistic sense of your concept. Because likely you're also going to send your food to different parts of the city. In the next slide we have, uh, we have a, a, a new project uh, rowboat, uh, which is a project about autonomous boats, which is being developed by the AMS Institute and, uh, and MIT. And it is very interesting because it's referring back to its uh, waterway infrastructure. As I mentioned earlier, um, uh, in the metropolitan area, eh, Amsterdam is a delta area, is a, is, is a delta city. So we have loads and loads of waterways. And these waterways gave us uh, our economical prosperity, eh, because it was very, very easy to, uh, to transport goods from outside of the city towards this in, the, in, uh, in the new city. And in this uh, in this project, they are developing, um, making use of these original waterways, which are still occurring, and uh, to link the, uh, the farmers in the hinterland to, to uh, transport goods again to the city. So you don't have to use um, yeah, trucks, etc. I think what you see is there, uh, there's more a need of um, uh, what, what you see, there's more a trend of the promotion of more regional, local food to make more uh, strong linkages. Um, another trend is that um, also uh, uh, the nutrient recovery, yeah, so really to, uh, to produce uh, and, and to innovate in new uh, innovative ways of food production, to really focus not only on the food production but also on the nutrient uh, recover recovery to valorize uh, this food waste uh, and also to reduce the number of food miles. Um, yeah, maybe you, you, uh, you are aware of this, uh, uh, this example of the Parma ham, the Parma ham, um, the, the pigs, the Dutch pigs are eating food which is being produced in South America, which is trans transported to the, uh, to the Rotterdam Harbor, Harbor area. Uh, to feed the pigs, to grow the pigs, then the pigs are being sent to the city of Parma to get this label and to do the processing to a ham and then the ham is being sent back to the Netherlands. So that involves quite some food miles. Um, I think that's it, it, I, I can imagine that your concept could also have an interesting position in that. Uh, in terms of business cases, because um, there are quite some initiatives um, uh, who calculated already um, what the potential business case is of, um, of greenhouse uh, or of, uh, of vertical uh, farming. And I can imagine that, um, uh, um, that can, Amsterdam is a very multicultural city. We have loads and loads of international, inter, international, internationalities. And they still have a relation, a food relation, to get their tropical and subtropical products all the way from uh, along the hemisphere. So it can be also interesting, which, uh, which is again involving loads of food miles. I can imagine that you also can focus on the need of these multicultural uh, inhabitants of the city Amsterdam, so that you produce uh, food specifics. Another interesting is uh, uh, the growing number of restaurants in the, uh, in the city of Amsterdam. Uh, try maybe also to link with the top chef, so real the high quality uh, uh, restaurants and really produce food with a story. Uh, but probably it will also be a sort of a combination of different business cases, education, uh, food production, uh, uh, living lab approach. So, I hope uh, my presentation gives you a better understanding of the more food-related context in the metropolitan area of Amsterdam. And I wish you all the luck and I'm really looking forward to your 
concepts of new greenhouse and uh, vertical farming concepts. Thank you. Hello, my name is Dirk Wascher. I'm working for Wageningen and Environmental Research and there in the Department of Land Use Change and um, uh, Regional Development. We are focusing in the last years increasingly on the topic of food planning, an emerging topic in academia and also in the planning world, as we normally talk more about agriculture and eventually of food in the stores, of food quality, but the link between the two has not yet been addressed uh, that much or properly. One of the projects which we are having developed uh, for the metropole region of Amsterdam is uh, called the Evidence-Based Food System Design Approach. Um, this is something which addresses the topic of integration and food resilience and I'm going to explain a little bit what this means and also show what we are actually doing. Uh, the topic of integration is uh, first of all uh, something which addresses the people who deal with the topic and that's largely divided between different policy departments who normally do not talk with each other but who are all specialized and have their own legislation. So this is a case in transport this is with health and welfare, with nature conservation, education, etc. Everywhere we do have a slice of food items in these uh, types of programs, but uh, the common thread line is not being picked up and uh, as a result uh, food is not really being addressed in an efficient way. Um, nevertheless, this had been fortunately recognized by many institutions in the world. There has been a large effort being made during the Expo 2015 in Milan, leading to the Milan Food um, uh, Pact, which is a um, uh, concerted action by more than 200 mayors of the world who would, would like to put their cities on the map of food planning. This is something uh, really uh, new and, and, uh, and challenging uh, for many because it means that uh, mayors and cities are taking charge of a topic which has been overlooked over many decades. And other initiatives are as well taking place. I mean, we have front running cities like Vancouver, also Toronto, which have developed food policies. And also in the metropole region of Amsterdam, we now have since, uh, literally since uh, two weeks, so this has been in December 2017, um, we have a uh, food council, which is um, actually a, a permanent, let's say, place to uh, contact and to exchange about the future of food in Amsterdam region. The topic of resilience, often mentioned but nevertheless not necessarily clear. Resilience comes out of the ecosystem science and it means that an ecosystem is able to recover certain shocks and changes that can occur through, the, let's say, an earthquake, wildfires, any kinds of droughts, etc. And that the system has a way of re-establishing itself uh, that takes time, but it also needs some components to basically be able to draw upon. And it's important for the system that it has these types of, whether it's some access to water, whether it's some ability in terms of plant growth and climax situations. Um, so this uh, process is something which uh, uh, is a model and has become a model for also the concept of urban resilience. Because also cities are exposed to pressures and to large scale changes. We think about climate change, about certain types also of um, population changes and migration aspects. And somehow the city has to deal with it. And it's the same type of thinking behind uh, the notion of urban resilience. And if you go one step further in this type of thinking, you end up thinking about food resilience or food system resilience. And that's, uh, you can probably already imagine it, means does the food supply of the city, is it stable? Can it be exposed to shocks eventually, for example, like in London uh, during the time of the uh, Iceland uh, volcano outbreak? The city of London had been three or four days been isolated and not been um, able to receive uh, food via the, um, the app, uh, airport and airplane uh, supply. And it was a serious, let's say, crisis uh, uh, at the threshold. And nevertheless, the city managed, of course, to get through this, but it shows that these uh, food shocks and food system events uh, can uh, seriously uh, impact on a city. So this is what we'd like to um, find out, which kind of vulnerabilities are there and how we can prevent types of um, negative effects. Um, when thinking about the city, 
the novel aspect of it is actually that we think beyond the city. Something which is um, normally taken care for in concepts like transport and, and logistics. And of course we have these links, you know, different types of hierarchies in the transport system. But the topic of food has uh, yet made it uh, absolutely um, necessary to reconsider the role of the countryside for the city. And it should be more than just an area of recreation and natural uh, dwelling in natural areas, but to also see how that type of countryside can contribute to the supply of healthy food. And so we differentiate between actually three realms. This is the micro level. And the micro level uh, is something which uh, is basically what we uh, see in the city center area, in the really built up urban area, which is the, the concrete part of it. And around it, um, the metropolitan zone, this would be considered the mesoscale, like something like of an in-between zone. It's not the rural countryside, it's not remote, it's in reach for the city, but it is clearly different. And then uh, more invisible and not identical with the rural zone would be the macro level, which is in food system talks, it's really the global level of food supply, uh, food traveling uh, at, at basically distant uh, uh, to distant origins. So these three levels uh, need to be in a certain type of healthy connection. And there we have uh, criteria for measuring resilience and they have to do with diversity of the production line with resource efficiency that there's not too much uh, spillage of energy and, and uh, chemicals and waste. There is a capacity to transform, to adapt. There is a possibility of having self-resilience, to have enough food and have enough supply so that you're independent from other sources. And of course also transparency to understand what's going on, that people and the legislation and the public understand it. All these things together um, make out a an, an resilient food system and are not yet uh, properly, let's say, followed up or uh, monitored. The project uh, which I'm addressing here, the evidence-based um, uh, food system design approach, uh, is actually based on a collaboration with many institutes, such as the Hochschule von Amsterdam, the uh, Eres Institute uh, in Almere, and uh, the AMS uh, Institute here in uh, Amsterdam. Um, as the name suggests, um, gathering information on the evidence, which sounds almost a little bit criminalistic, but in this case is meant uh, to um, find out the most relevant data sets to understand the food system, is something which we uh, start off with. And this means that we uh, examine uh, on, an, on the level of geographic information system and digitally uh, register data sets the type of uh, relevant data layers. And this is something, for example, on the uh, food flows, basically the food trafficking in and out of the city, actually the most difficult data set to gather because we have lots of static uh, information, static information on it, but the linkages and the exact flows are difficult to track. But then we do have, of course, about food actors, we have information about circular economy system elements, which are, for example, uh, rest uh, heat uh, of, of uh, different industries or certain types of recycling um, places. All this information is going to be gathered. And we also have information on the ecological footprint of the food consumption. And that's, uh, um, this slide shows the ecological footprint analysis for the city of Amsterdam and Almere and it shows it in different dimensions. You see the inside um, circles, these are these yellow circles, which so show the actually area needed for Amsterdam to, be, to grow the food on. So this is the large circle for the city of Amsterdam with their 799,000 inhabitants. And for Almere, it's clearly less. It's something like 200,000 inhabitants, and that would be that circle. And it's just all the agricultural areas within these circles which would hold enough ground to supply these people um, with food. Then you see the outside circle, the really large one. That's the one which is the so-called transition zone. And that means it's the whole, let's say, population of the metropolitan region of Amsterdam, which is 2.3 million people. So you get an idea about, on the one hand, that uh, there is, of course, agricultural land which could potentially supply the city. At the same time, we do know there are many other cities in the neighborhood and it's foreseeable that there is a conflict of interest and a lack of sufficient ground. 
But it gives you an idea, such a map, where to look for if you want to feed a city from the regional Achterland. So if you look at the different types of scale issues, which I addressed, then we can see, let's say, that within these areas, food is of course not distributed in exactly the same way as it is demanded. This means um, there is, for example, a high demand on feed for livestock, because as we all know, food uh, supply is mainly taken by the enormous amount of water and resources for um, uh, feeding livestock. So we, we see in these types of overviews that there is always a deficit uh, in these surroundings on having sufficient livestock feed in the area to feed all the uh, meat producing animals. Another thing is we see that we have a surplus of grassland in this area, which is nice and probably also something we should always consider as being the cultural landscape type of that region. At the same time, it means by having the surplus, it's not really needed to supply this, these cities of Almere or the whole metropole region with, uh, with milk and dairy products. So there is some kind of flexibility. And where we have always a chronic um, uh, deficit is on vegetables and on, uh, on fruit. So therefore, such an analysis can help us to look at areas where the surplus could eventually offer opportunities for growing more other food which is actually needed in the region. This is the same slide uh, just for Almere to show a little bit the differences and to zoom in. Um, I just let, it, let you look at it. Just for matters of um, method, um, we of course took out in the consideration which areas are there for growing food. We took out all the protected areas for nature conservation, which is the Natura 2000 at the European level and uh, European legislation piece. And of course the ecological main structure of the Netherlands, which is protected areas where we do not consider to come to be to offer the type of food supply. We took out the forests, we took out the waterways and uh, the water bodies and the city of course itself. So only the remaining areas were considered. Um, this is just a graphic uh, display of how the project is uh, conceptualized. So what we are doing uh, currently is the type of evidence-based analysis. And we've done uh, further work also in case studies in different locations in Europe. So for example in um, Milan. Uh, in, the, uh, in Italy at the city and also in Kanawurf, a small town in Germany. And we're considering to also work with our approach in Lisbon. So here's an example of Milan. Um, there's a tiny little point in the middle. You see eventually an, uh, uh, an area at the southern edge of the city, which is uh, Porto di Mare. And um, it's kind of like a little, um, little oval uh, piece of, of boundary. You see further in this map a green zone uh, corridor or belt around the city, which we consider to be not the main source of food. Then comes the actually uh, food ring, which supplies, uh, you know, in terms of uh, amount of land, Milan with the main food, uh, which is all related to vegetables and to wheat and oil seeds and all these plants. And then the outer ring, all this land would be needed, and in this way it's a conceptual approach, all this land would be needed just to feed all the livestock which is being consumed in Milan. So this is an, an overview for Milan, and, and we see how students there have developed for this little piece, the Porto di Mare area, a food hub and a, let's say, food landscape, which would give this place a more specific uh, role within the whole food system of Milan, of acting like a connector between the Achterland and um, the city center demand areas. Here's an image from uh, Thuringia in Germany, very different. The site in the middle is a little blue spot, Kanawurf, a tiny little village with a castle and uh, surrounded by these larger cities and metropoles like Leipzig, Kassel, Erfurt and uh, Göttingen. And there we see how this is located and how, let's say, the food rings of these cities uh, can be envisioned. And here also students worked on conceptualizing the ecological footprint approach. You see from the city of Kanawurf, which has been sketched out here as a little black spot in the middle, you see this red footprint would be the size of the land needed to feed the 700 people living in Kanawurf. So it's just this principle which you can work with in these areas and which is interesting to put things into perspective. And so we continue with this assessment for Amsterdam. We have here three case studies depicted 
um, which is in Zarnstadt, in Haarlemmermeer and in Almere. So within these areas there are uh, more details of course which we will apply. We will talk to stakeholders in the region in Haarlemmermeer about let's say different types of food products. We know in Haarlemmermeer there are a number of large-scale farmers who do not see a future for maintaining their business and with them we were going to talk about maybe other ways of uh, producing something directly for the city instead of the world market. We also talked to Almere where we know that for example the onion sector is in search for a new destination. There is a crisis in the onion market and there are huge amounts of onions being produced and there is a large dependency of agriculture in this area on the onion market. And it's not necessarily what comes to your mind in the first place if you think about urban agriculture is not that you need to help the world scale onion market. But at the same time, it's something in the proximity of these city centers and these farmers are looking for a new alternative. So we would like to discuss this with them as well. And of course, we have the uh, Zahnstadt where there is interest in circular economy and logistic uh, solutions where we uh, work with them on their scale. So we use all kinds of references and information, for example, the location of the agricultural holdings, and we also use this information on food industry companies. And what we did, we clustered this information to develop so-called heat maps, where we see how and where the most of these uh, food industry companies are being situated, which can give us a lead on where to, for example, establish a food hub with, with which types of companies to cooperate more closely and to also adapt the logistic system to it. And our partners at the Hochschule von Amsterdam, they are specialized on looking into the logistic systems of the city. We see here the analysis for the city of Amsterdam, looking at the different types of primary production, then the food, food industry, the large-scale um, um, market, Horeca, which is restaurant uh, business, and we see uh, a breakdown, for example, here on all kinds of uh, types of um, uh, food actors with whom we can talk and we can identify. Um, on this slide you see, uh, you know, zooming in, uh, a specific case for one of these points uh, where we have, you know, the type of the uh, food actor role, uh, what their function is and uh, in which category they belong and how large, let's say, the places they uh, administer or they, uh, their company is in, the, uh, in command of. And this information exists for each of these dots. So this is something where we can operate in, uh, um, in the food system quite well with, we think. So we now see a slide on the uh, food stream assessment from the Hochschule von Amsterdam and it only re relates to the city of Amsterdam and it's only the quantities. We do not have lo lo locations and a str a stream directions but we only know what goes into the system, what goes out. But interestingly enough we see that on the left side there is only this tiny little green stream associated with the input of the local farmers and this other, all the red wider streams entering the system come from the food industry which is being basically supported by the world market or where the origins are unknown. In any case you see the split off how it goes to the different type of consumption places, the retail, the markets, the restaurants etc etc and then we see you know the supermarkets take a very big uh, chunk of this out and then we see how this translates into waste streams for water, but also normal waste streams, which ultimately end up in waste incinerations. And this way there is an, uh, a, a clear, let's say, uh, also um, waste-oriented food system um, uh, process in place, which we would like to turn into a more a circular one. Um, I can summarize, you know, the, uh, the efforts of this project going towards um, working towards lower energy costs and the lower energy needs for the whole system, having less CO2 and less climate uh, greenhouse gas uh, effects. We would like to make these food chains more transparent for the public and for the users in order to understand better where they are good and where they are bad in. We would like to involve regional actors and uh, be in an exchange on opportunities and different business models which kind of address the region rather than the world market. And then we would like to see whether we can redesign the food system in a way that the different partners and players cooperate and integrate their approaches. Part of this will be that we work towards stronger, stronger regional partnerships altogether. 
so the basis of our efforts is that food exports should really be more addressing quality instead of quantity, which is the case now. And we would like to see that urban populations become less vulnerable for external changes and have a much more self-reliance and food security within the realm of their control. And eating responsible means also that there is a closer link between the consumers and understanding the landscape where the food comes from. Thank you very much.